Welcome to uh, uh, today's session of um, the Professionalism Seminar Series. Um, we're, we're absolutely delighted that our two colleagues could join us today, Far Kerlin and John Yoon. Uh, Far is from the General Medicine Division, and John Yoon is from the Hospitalist uh, Section in the Department of Medicine. Um, uh, uh, they're both working on a long-term project on the good physician, uh, which will be a longitudinal study of um, the, the development, formation uh, of medical students. Um, and uh, today, today they're going to talk to us on the topic of can virtue be taught? Uh, actually, can virtue be taught to physicians? Contemporary investigations of a timeless question. Uh, I'm eager to hear the presentation. You will, you will. Really? Is, is, are we close? We're close. Good. Good timing. Well, thank you, Mark. And uh, John and I and our, our colleague Ken Rosinski, is Ken here? Yeah, there he is. He's very bad. Um, have been working on this project together. I'm going to be the, the, uh, the one volunteer to, do, uh, to stand up here, and then John is going to help me make sure I answer questions correctly. This is a project that um, began a few years ago as we sat around asking ourselves the question, how, do, how would we know whether all of these different interventions that medical educators use to try to make doctors come out of the end of medical training as good physicians, or in the terms of this seminar, as prof with professionalism, how do we know if those things are working? What is it, in fact, that goes into the formation and the development of a physician who is characterized by the kinds of attributes that we would hope they would carry? Um, and is that something that is more or less decided at, when they enter? Uh, or how much does the medical education and medical training process really make a difference? And if it does make a difference, what parts of it make a difference? So that was a, a conversation uh, that we had, and then we set out to try to figure out a way to empirically measure this. And what we want to do today is invite you to hear about that, the, the, uh, that part or that journey of ours up to the point where we are now, which is uh, very much in midstream. And um, as Mark said, we hope to we hope to develop a study that will become a longitudinal study that goes on for several years, and I'll explain that. Uh, but we are just beginning now. So this is a good moment to get more feedback from colleagues who've been thinking about these issues in your own walks and in this, in this, as you've participated in this seminar. So again, the project comes out of a question that's very much at the heart of this year's seminar series. By the way, can you guys, am I standing too much in the way? Is this, this is an okay spot? All right. Okay, thanks. How does one become a good, that is to say, you think I should turn it, uh, virtuous physician? Now, this is Sir William Osler, once called the saint at uh, Johns Hopkins, and as Dr. Solmazy and other Hopkins eyes can tell us, he's still, there's still certain forms of worship and and devotions that go on to Sir William Osler, and for good reason. Widely recognized, though, I think, as an exemplar of the good physician. So we're asking ourselves here, how does one become such an exemplar, even if in more modest terms? And the timeless question rears itself with some force in today's, uh, in contemporary American medicine, because while today's medical science has steadily grown in its powers to cure disease and alleviate suffering, the American public, and this may be perhaps paradoxical, but the American public has been steadily losing its trust in physicians. So this graph shows data from the General Social Survey indicating that over recent decades, the public's confidence in the medical profession has steadily declined. Why would that be? In his book, Trusting Doctors, The Decline of Moral Authority in American Medicine, the sociologist Jonathan Ember hints toward one possibility. He argues that Americans once viewed medicine as a sacred vocation, 
But now physicians have become more valued for their technical competence than for their noble character. That's his quote. Ironically, the field of bioethics may have unwittingly contributed to this decline by focusing on the procedural dimensions of clinical decisions, often at least, rather than on the moral agency of clinicians. So there's been a lot more work focusing on whether something is permissible, and with respect to that, whether the appropriate decision-making procedures have been followed. Think about how much time we spend in medical ethics case conferences asking who the, who, whether someone has decisional capacity, whether that's been assessed properly, how we respect their autonomy, focusing on substituted judgment, the procedures of informed consent, et cetera, and much less time on the question of how do we form good decision makers, people who would have the habit of making the right decision. Uh, Leon Cass once said, though, quote, though originally intended to improve our, our deeds, the practice of ethics, if truth be told, has at best improved our speech. I think that's an overstatement. But bioethics focus on moral dilemmas does seem to divert our attention in the profession away from questions related to the moral character of physicians and the virtues needed for the good practice of medicine in our world. And in response to these trends, there have been many medical organizations, we've been hearing about some of them over the course of this seminar, uh, that have launched major initiatives to teach physician professionalism, as it's called, as a core competency in medical training. In this seminar series, with the language of professionalism it adopts, is one outcome of such initiatives. The University of Chicago has its own professionalism ventures. Uh, but even here, little is known about whether and how these efforts actually shape the character and the practices of physicians. So that's how we got into this project. And at the outset, we recognize that as scholars from many disciplines in social science and in and in uh, philosophy have recognized medical training includes a process of moral enculturation through which physicians and trainings acquire not only technical skills and specialized knowledge, but also come to take on those values, attitudes, and durable characteristics, virtues and vices, you might say, that make for a more or less good physician. So our question was, how, do we, how can we take advantage of this natural experiment in moral enculturation and formation, that is, medical training, to find medicine's contemporary answer to Plato's ancient question via Meno to Socrates? Can virtue be taught to physicians? Or if not, does it come by practice? Or does it come neither by practice nor by teaching, but by nature or in some other way? I think that question rings very relevant to us uh, in, in medical education today. Interestingly, in an editorial uh, a decade ago, Dan Solmacy drew upon this question and pondered whether medical schools themselves could be transformed into schools for virtue. He wrote there, the cynics will contend that virtue cannot be taught, that students come to us already morally packaged and incapable of change. The data shows that Students can, and in fact do change. Unfortunately, this change is in the wrong direction. And indeed, many studies of medical uh, trainees bear out Dan's observation. So again, why is that the case? What are the causes of this moral decline, if you will? And which of those causes are the most important? Um, and what factors might mitigate a tendency for physicians to grow less rather than more virtuous over the course of training. To answer these questions, what we need, we think, at, at a minimum, as I want to say up front, this is a hard, we think this is a very think, hard thing to study empirically, and we're trying. Um, and we, we think we have good reasons for how we're trying, but, but uh, this is a tough, it's a tough subject to study, and, I'll, and we'll see some of the reasons why. But what we need at least is, um, a longitudinal study that would follow national cohorts of physicians from matriculation to medical school to several years after completing postgraduate clinical training, um, measuring along the way the key variables, the ones, the variables that matter. We would expect up front that individual characteristics, durable characteristics of that medical trainee and contextual factors, both curricular 
and other aspects of their experience and training uh, that would make a difference, that there'd be both virtue sustaining factors, virtue inhibiting factors, and that they would interact in some complex manner to determine the extent to which medical students develop and sustain those characteristics that we would admire in, in a physician. And a longitudinal design would allow researchers to assess the interplay of those factors over time. Interestingly, no such study has ever been done in the United States, but we, so we set out to try to lay the groundwork for it. And over the past year and a half, we've conducted a pilot study, which I'm going to describe further. This is a national med medical student survey where we conduct, where we collect data at two points over time. All right, two points is the minimum um, imaginable longitudinal study. Um, <laughs> And uh, that's where we wanted to start because we wanted to see how, what does it require to pull this off? Uh, can we get people in? Can we gather data in these, these different ways? I'm gonna, some experimental ways I'm going to describe. Um, and I'm, again, staving off your disappointment at the end, the data I'm going to present from this is very early and it's only from the first uh, wave of data collection because we're in process of finishing data collection on the second time point. All right, here were the objectives for this project. First, to build and test an administrative architecture for effectively fielding a longitudinal study of physicians in training. The idea is that this study would follow in the tradition of the great longitudinal educational surveys of past decades, several of which have been done successfully, um, while taking advantage of some of the unique capacities and efficiencies made possible by today's computer-based uh, survey technologies. The second objective is to develop and refine robust measures of generosity, medical generosity, empathy, and mindfulness uh, uh, in medicine. And uh, we'll discuss the rationale for selecting these particular virtues in a moment. And the third is to, to examine students' narratives of their professional formation and development over the course of medical school. So Alistair McIntyre was one of the first speakers in this seminar. And uh, his work over the past few decades has uh, a central theme of it has been the argument that virtuous practitioners of any practice, take any kind of human practice, understand their work as fitting into a life narrative that involves a quest for the good, for what is worthy, for what is virtuous, through the harms, dangers, temptations, and distractions encountered on the way. That when you think of a good practitioner, they have a sense of sort of a commitment to something good in this work and how this work fits into it. And they, they see it as a, an effort that involves uh, not necessarily an easy uh, path of avoiding ways of falling off, off track. And we want to know how students think about their work potentially rel uh, in, you know, in a way that's, that relates to that framework. And th that would involve ob obtaining qualitative data, which we are just beginning to do, using a narrative interviewing method that a colleague of ours, Dr. Dan McAdams at Northwestern, developed in generating life stories around what it means to be a virtuous person. And the idea is to adapt this uh, to, to, to focus on physicians' life stories around what it means to be a virtuous physician or good physician. A central challenge for any empirical science of virtues is to specify the characteristics most relevant to a particular domain. All right, there are, in this case, medicine. Uh, and then we have to find ways to empirically measure those. And, and we're mindful here of Aristotle's admonition um, in his Nicomachean Ethics to not demand greater precision and certainty than a subject will allow. Um, so you're going to have to, uh, well, you'll see. There, this is going to be an imperfect set of measures, and I think that's of the nature of this. But here's how we proceeded. So we begin with McIntyre's definition of virtue, which is essentially his formulation of Aristotle's account. Quote, a virtue is an acquired human quality, the possession and the exercise of which tends to enable us to achieve those goods which are internal to practices and the lack of which effectively present, prevents us from achieving any such goods. We then follow the physician philosopher Edmund Pellegrino, who also spoke in this series, who applied McIntyre's reformulation of Aristotelian virtue ethics to elaborate um, those virtues that are essential to achieving the goods internal to the practice of medicine, namely the preservation, promotion, and restoration of health. So putting these together, we might say that a medical virtue is an acquired human quality 
the possession and the exercise of which tends to enable a physician to achieve the preservation, promotion, and restoration of health, and the lack of which effectively prevents physicians from achieving these goods. Now, there are many medical virtues. And for this study, we could not focus on them all. And after a lot of thought and discussion, I won't go into the details of that, we chose to focus on three. Empathy, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, mindfulness, uh, well, in generosity, empathy, and mindfulness. Why these three? Well, first, these virtues are central to the doctor-patient relationship and to the good practice of medicine across virtually all specialties. In other words, physicians and patients, I think, can generally agree that these are virtues that are essential to being a good physician pretty much no matter your specialty. There may be a couple specialties, it doesn't matter. Um, like pathology, I don't know how much empathy you need to be a good pathologist, but, but pretty much across the clinical specialties. Second, the field of positive psychology has done a lot of work to develop validated measures of these virtues that can be put in a self-administered survey. And though we would like to assess the virtue of prudence or good clinical judgment in medicine, we've not come up with a feasible way of doing so uh, using self-reported survey items. We, we hope to, but we haven't yet. Uh, third, these virtues are considered foundational in leading theories of virtue development and mature moral functioning. So for example, Scholars from various disciplines, and particularly the fields of moral and social psychology, have described mindfulness and empathy as sets of metacognitive skills. Mindfulness focused on the self, empathy focused on the other. Mindfulness is one manifestation of a metacognitive skill that promotes moral self-reflection, uh, self-monitoring, and an active attention to one's thoughts, motivations, and actions. And similarly, empathy can be thought of as a metacognitive skill that allows us to understand and respond adaptively to others' emotions and to promote prosocial behavior. It's not, I don't think, accidental that both of these are very central to efforts within medical education uh, to try to, again, develop good physicians, to add something to the development of physicians. In this way, mindfulness and empathy serve as metacognitive precursors that are necessary for the formation of most, if not all, other virtues. Generosity is expressed in a variety of altruistic and pro-social behaviors, but we, being focused on medicine, we're interested specifically in what's been called interpersonal generosity, which is the form of generosity in which an individual spends herself, so gives her attention, her time, her emotion, her energy, etc., in service to others. For those in medicine and other helping professions, it seems to us that generosity would, would be a crucial marker of moral maturity. Um, and that rings, seems to ring true to, uh, to most people. We think of these three virtues as related to one another in an order of dependence, so that in order to perform particular acts of interpersonal generosity, you must have a habit of empathic concern. And in order to develop empathic concern, you have to have the mindful capacity to step back from your own thought processes and actions to recognize and appreciate the thought processes and actions of the other. Now, early on, we scoured the literature and talked to our advisors and other experts in the field to select existing measures of generosity, empathy, and mindfulness. And then we developed novel physician-specific instruments to measure these virtues. You, you can see here, for example, you have the Loyola generativity scale that's been used widely in different population samples or the interpersonal reactivity index been used again by psychologists in multiple different populations, the five facet mindfulness model. And these Chicago versions are our uh, forms of adapting those to the field of, of medicine. Let me just show you a flavor of how this was done. So here, here are examples of the Chicago physician generosity scale. Each of these scales has 10 or 12 measures. Here's a, a few of them excerpted. I go the extra mile to help take care of my patients. Uh, I, I make time to pay extra careful attention to patients' problems. I eagerly look for moments in which I can teach patients something helpful to them. Or the empathy scale. I try to imagine myself in my patients' shoes when providing care to them. I can tell when patients are sad even when they do not say anything. I listen carefully to my patients when they need to get something off their chests. 
mindfulness. In my clinical work, it seems like I'm running on automatic without paying much attention to what I'm doing. Has anybody here ever felt that way? I overlook clinical clues in a case because of carelessness or not paying attention or, or thinking of something else. After a, clinical, a difficult interaction with a patient or colleague, I try to slow down and think over why I behave the way I did. And how often is this true for you? Now, you may be asking yourself, um, as we, as certainly I was, why would I trust someone else's judgment of how generous they are? Uh, why should you trust my judgment of how empathetic I am? Uh, and I think that's a very important question. So the social psychologists have worked hard at these measures, but I think there's this really, if you think about the virtue theory, at least in the philosophical field, and if you go all the way back to Aristotle, um, the, virtu virtuous, uh, the virtues of a person are really best discerned by the many and the wise, as he said. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're best discerned by the observations of people who are themselves virtuous, uh, because they're the ones who really know what virtue is. And you can't just pick one of them. Now, how can we get the many and the wise to weigh in on whether Dr. Siegler or Dr. Yoon is empathetic or generous and so on? What we're going to do is, and this is one of the novel things we've, we, the things that hasn't really been done, at least not in medical education in this kind of a study, is, is to use peer ratings. So people have consented in the first data collection point in our survey to be a part of this second part, most of them have, in which they're going to go on a website and they're going to see the names of their, their classmates who, have all, who are also part of the study and they're going to rate those classmates on several different physician virtues including a final rating on, on a kind of, I forget how it goes, but something like to what extent you would trust them in the care of your loved one, um, to be involved in the care of your loved one. And we're going to see whether those measures appears to what extent they cohere with or correlate with people's measures about themselves. At least it, one hypothesis we have is that the, 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 the group of medical trainees that's may, maybe most morally problematic or needs to be watched are those who have rate themselves very high and their colleagues rate them very low. Okay, let me, let me press forward a little bit. Let's tell you what we did. Uh, last year we surveyed um, 960 third year medical students from 24 schools. Now, although there, there are 133 U.S. allopathic medical schools, we chose a sampling method among schools to ensure that our national sample represented <coughs> students from a range of different school characteristics, such as public versus private. We wanted to sample from all four, S, four U.S. census regions and from schools throughout all levels of ranking scores, both from the U.S. News and World Report and from social mission score rankings. We selected only third-year students because of interest in sampling students with some clinical experience uh, in, in working with potential role models in medicine um, and because these experiences, the clinical experiences are where you start to see expressed, uh, at least in theory, the, the, the characteristics that are, that are the medical virtues. Um, and as of today, through, through a combination of mailed and online questionnaires, we've obtained an adjusted response rate of 63% of the people we uh, sent out surveys to. And we're on the verge of completing the, the second data collection. Um, and we have so far a response rate of more than 80% of those who completed the first data collection point have responded to the second. And in addition to filling out a paper and pencil questionnaire, we asked students to go to a secure website where they provide email addresses and other contact, contact information. And they do some open-ended, fill some open-ended items, which again is starting into that question of their narrative of their experiences in medical training. We're going to, I mentioned before, we're about to do these qualitative interviews. Um, uh, and just to focus on that a little bit, the, the idea here is that the life narratives might be sensitive to the influence of their environments and context um, on their students' moral formation and character development. So you guys have all heard the term uh, of the hidden curriculum. So the ideas embedded within the hidden curriculum of medical education are a wide array of narratives containing both villains uh, and virtuous protagonists that students consciously or unconsciously adopt during the process of their professional character formation. And these narratives are often transmitted and perpetuated by clinical role models 
to exert a powerful influence, we, we imagine, on the moral formation of physicians in training. So we expect that students' narratives will reflect a struggle, uh, their struggles, to exhibit virtue in learning environments where such virtues are not always honored or rewarded. And we're all familiar with this, people talking about how hard it is to really care about your patients if you don't see people around you caring about your patients. Humans are storytelling animals, McIntyre notes, and in classical society, the chief method of moral education was the telling of stories. This is echoed in the work of Robert Coles, the work of Jack Coulihan, uh, and they're using literature in medical education. Uh, the story narratives function to establish physicians' professional identity by setting the plot and subplots of their work with its themes and particularities, and, and set it into the context of a unified, virtuous life. So the efforts to analyze their narratives, we hope, will enrich our understanding of how these virtues are sustained or inhibited in the experience of medical training. And that's enough about that. Again, by, by the way, in, the, in these, much as we did with the medical schools, we do these qualitative interviews by selecting on student characteristics. So we're going to select some of those students who are rated by their peers as on the low end of the physician virtues, or, or rate themselves anyway in their measures on the low end. Some of those. Um, or on the high end, some who are particularly have high academic performance, some who maybe don't, and and then we're gonna uh, uh, and there's a few other characteristics we're inter interested in. All right, to give you an overall overall idea of the characteristics of our respondents, these slides display their demographic characteristics. They're pretty evenly divided, as you can see, between gender by gender, uh, distributed across region and across schools from all ranking levels of social mission scores. Uh, they are distributed in ways that are pretty typical with respect to ethnicity, immigration status, and we also measured student debt, which we think is, has an important role in some of the, some of the, the questions we're interested in. Um, now this is, a, this is a busy slide, but I won't go through all of this, but um, if McIntyre's right, Virtuous practitioners seek goods internal to a practice itself. Now, that means they don't do the practice in order to get wealthy. They don't do the practice in order to get esteem from other people and so on. They do it because it's good in itself to do it. None of us, none of us is that way entirely. Um, we, we are human after all. But the more virtuous folks, at least in theory, should, should be after the, the goods inside the practice. So to, to get at that somewhat, we asked about a sense of uh, vocation or calling in one's work as a physician. And we included other measures from work motivation and life satisfaction literature. And if practical wisdom leads to uh, what the, the Greeks called eudaimonia or true happiness, we would think that physicians with higher ratings on the medical virtues will find their work more meaningful and will be more fulfilled in it. We'll have to test that. We don't know that yet. Uh, but we asked students to indicate how satisfied they are with their work in medicine. With respect to predictors, we include a list of variables that are associated in prior research with physicians' career choices and specifically their, their practice among the underserved, which we think is one way of expressing generosity. Um, not the only one, but one that we're interested in. Uh, that includes demographics, personality characteristics, uh, undergraduate major, immigration history, <coughs> educational debt load and so on. And um, we include some measures of moral foundations and intuitions from Jonathan Haidt's work, if any of you are familiar with that, and religious characteristics, uh, you know, extending my own interest in, in the intersection of religion and the practice of medicine. We also asked respondents about what we believe are potential facilitators to the development of medical virtue, if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, um, including one of, the, one of our hypotheses that a desire to follow in the footsteps of a, an exemplar physician and an exposure to people who they would identify as clinical exemplars helps them become like those that they admire. Um, we also measure factors that we believe pose obstacles to the development of virtue. And here I'm going to focus a little bit on burnout, which has been shown or has been described in the medical literature pretty extensively as a real obstacle to the flourishing uh, of physicians and to their development. We also added a measure uh, at the, uh, the strong encouragement of our colleagues in the world of psychology um, of entitlement, uh, which in the general psych psychological literature has emerged as one of the chief obstacles to the de development of virtues 
uh, and which we would hypothesize would affect the development of the virtues uh, in medicine as well. So you might even draw to your mind, take a minute, draw to your mind someone you think is pretty entitled, one of your colleagues, and ask yourself if that maybe is, that's maybe a, a marker of, uh, of a problem uh, in their development. So here's, here's just a pie chart uh, on one of our items about people's interactions with role models. We asked them, who is the physician you most admire? And then we had them answer a few characteristics about them. 60% roughly identified someone they'd worked with on the wards in medical school. Another, other big categories were a personal or family friend. Remember, a, I don't remember the exact percentage, but a significant number of do doctors um, are family members, have family members who are doctors. And then a preceptor or a mentor they sought out themselves or assigned by school. Anyway, uh, then we asked them, to what extent does the ch the, your choice, uh, let me just say this exactly, does that, what is, to what extent does your desi does desire to follow in the footsteps of a physician you admire influence your specialty choice? This is asked right after we've asked them to indicate which specialty they, they intend to go in at this point in time, recognizing they're not all going to be fully decided. And interestingly, about half of people say little to no influence. Uh, but about half say some to a lot to a few say the most possible influence. Now, um, we then asked, uh, we then looked, we didn't ask them this, we looked at, at the specialty of the, of the physician they identified as the one they admire most and the specialty they say they were gonna, they're going to go to themselves. And, and among all the students, uh, and these specialties are pretty granular, so we have, I, I think, 12 or something or mm -hmm. 15 you know, subspecialties, about 14% of folks uh, identify the same specialty. And then just as an affirmation of some substance of that prior question, we see that um, among those who <coughs> said that uh, a desire to follow in the footsteps of a physician and influence their specialty choice, about 23% 20, said they're are going into the same specialty versus 12% among those who said little or no influence. That both shows that there's something there and then it's not terribly powerful, uh, at least in these data. Here we have the mean empathy scores. This is on those scales, the 10 or 12 item scales for the respondents. And we've broken them up by, uh, the, in the blue are people who have, we dichotomize them, who have low burnout scores and in the, uh, the maroon are people with high burnout scores and basically what this shows is that you see a modest but at least in the case of medical empathy significant uh, reduction or, or lower, lower levels of um, empathy among people who identify themselves as burned out. And in the future, we'll, we'll make these more graded, and you'll probably see stronger relationships for the ones who are really, really burned out. Uh, but here we just dichotomize them as an illustration. Here, just to, for those of you social scientists in the group, um, just uh, you, you see first, with respect to general empathic concern, uh, an alpha score of 0.79, which is a measure of to what extent these different items that the people responded to are measuring the same thing. That's pretty good. Uh, with the medical one, it wasn't quite as good, uh, but still solid. And we do find that people's empathy in general is correlated with their empathy in medicine, as you'd expect, and that the correlation is, it's, it's pretty strong, but it's not complete. We wouldn't, we frankly wouldn't want it to be complete, um, because then you might as well just ask about uh, their general uh, empathy, and we can at least imagine that there are people who have really cultivated in their practice habits of empathy that may not fully transfer over to the rest of their life, and vice versa. First of all, we want to, this is where we are today. Um, we want to clarify how best to measure virtue. That means we need to assess to what extent uh, self-rated measures of virtue correlate with peer ratings. That's one thing we need to do of those virtues, and of overall excellence in a physician trainee as judged by uh, one's peers. And, and then related to that, um, we want to examine to what extent different pre-medical school characteristics predict who will come to be characterized by medical virtues toward the end of medical school. This is Andy's uh, uh, question. So one of the, a couple of things we're interested in, because these are things used in selecting students, 
is to what extent is their intellectual horsepower, as measured by, say, MCAT scores, a predictor of whether they're going to be recognized by their peers four years later as outstanding? Um, to what extent does prior community service predict that they're going to be recognized by their peers as, as generous? And we also want to look at how traditional measures of academic performance, specifically grades and class quartile and AOA and so on, are associated with measures of these other uh, physician virtues and, and of students' rating of their peers. When we get to two data points, um, we can then start to look at your, uh, uh, Steve's question, which is what, what's the chicken and what's the egg here? Um, if you take empathy and burnout, you can imagine, I can imagine a plausible story in which um, the person who declines in virtue therefore declines, again, thinking about this theory of moral formation and virtue, they stop finding and seeking and finding intrinsic goods in their work. So they start to only make sense of their work as a way to get something. Maybe it's to please their parents, maybe it's to not, you know, to figure out a way to pay off all that debt they've accumulated. Uh, you know, it's, it's, to get a well, it's to get well. We can all imagine stories like that. And those people are going to be, in this theory, are going to be more burned out because that's just not deeply satisfying in the end. To do something for extrinsic rewards is not as satisfying as doing it for the intrinsic rewards. In that case, we'd expect to see over time that when, someone's, when someone starts to lose a sense of medicine being a worthwhile way to live a good life, then they start to become burned out. And... Uh, but the other story that makes sense is they start, people are trying hard to do their best, they love medicine and so on, and for whatever reasons, they start to burn out. They're exhausted, they're struggling to f keep up with what they think is the minimal necessary to really be doing a good job, and when they burn out, then they become jaded, and, they, and they're so exhausted they don't have the psychological and moral reserve to, to, to express the virtues, to even be empathetic to patients. And we can't tell that until we have multiple time points. And even two is going to be really hard to see, so we're going to need to see it over time. We want to thank you and John very much. Thank you all for your attention.